Hello, thank you for joining us today. I'm Laura Kunkel, America and Bloom's Executive Director. America and Bloom envisions communities across the country as welcoming and vibrant places to live, work, and play. That comes from benefiting from colorful plants and trees, enjoying clean environments, celebrating heritage, and the, and the planting pride that comes through volunteerism, through our programs, our grant opportunities, online resources, and the sharing of best ideas from towns and cities across the country, we empower communities to beautify and improve the overall quality of life. You can learn more about AIB at our website, americainbloom.org. Today's webinar is just one of the ways that we share information to help communities become more beautiful and vibrant. But we cannot do our programming without the generous support of our sponsors. Today's webinar is sponsored by Eason Horticultural Resources. Eason is a national broker servicing the needs of uh, retail garden centers, wholesale greenhouse growers, nurserymen, wholesalers, and landscapers. They are a critical part of the horticultural industry supply chain, and they are a critical part of our success because of their support of our mission. So thank you very much to Eason Horticultural Resources for sponsoring today's webinar. You can learn more about them by visiting their website at ehrnet.com. All right, so if you have any questions during the webinar, please put them in the Q&A section of your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen or on your mobile device, and we will answer questions at the end. For today's webinar, we are honored to have four people from the Logan, Ohio In Bloom Committee. This team has been instrumental in developing the Hocking Hills Butterfly Trail. We are grateful to have with us today Chris Klein, Jenna Balish, Andy Jones, and Kelly Capuzzi. For those not familiar with Logan, Ohio, this is a beautiful community located in Southeast Ohio in the heart of Hocking Hills. Uh, Logan has a population of nearly 7,300 people, and while the county has a population of 28,000. Thank you to the Logan and Bloom team for being with us today. Take it away. Very good. Well, my name's Chris Klein. I'm a part of the Logan and Bloom Committee. And uh, I'm the director of Butterfly Ridge, Butterfly Conservation Center uh, in the Hocking Hills. It's a few miles away from Logan. Uh, also the president of the Polygonia Foundation, which is a local nonprofit that works to benefit our local pollinators. And I wanted to start my section of, of our talk here today with this lovely family picture. So, um, so that is me right there. In my younger days uh, with my wife, we were newly married and then my parents here on the right. The star of this picture is actually my, uh, my mom's 1973 Plymouth Satellite Station Wagon. Um, my dad was quite proud of that car and, and the 400 cubic inch engine that it had. Uh, my dad by trade was an engine mechanic. So it, it hit dad hard one day when mom had to actually get her station wagon towed home because it wouldn't start. And so what dad did was he, uh, he would take, you know, what he thought was the offending part of the engine off, take it to work the next day, let it sit in the solvent tank for a while, test it out, clean it up. And then one thing that dad was very meticulous about was that he would repaint the part before he brought it back home. He would bring it home, the newly painted part, put it back on the engine and try it out and see if it would run. And unfortunately, this went on for three or four weeks and mom had quite a beautiful engine. Uh, the problem was it wouldn't run. And finally, dad was at the auto parts store and, and somebody gave him an idea of the next thing to try. And sure enough, that little $4 PCV valve was the thing that fixed the engine after dad had spent a month working on it and making it all pretty and everything. But my point with that story is just because something's pretty doesn't necessarily mean it's working. Um, and when we're talking about pollinators, you really need to move beyond pretty, okay? Just because your garden is pretty does not necessarily mean it's attracting pollinators. And so the question that might be running through your mind is, okay, well, how do I know if my garden's attracting pollinators or not? Well, you collect data. Um, 
Now, Butterfly Ridge, here's a sample of how we collect data. We've got spreadsheets that are a mile long from the transects that we walk and we document every single butterfly that we see. For you folks, that might be a little bit on the extreme side, but there are other ways to gather data so that you know whether your garden is actually functioning and running well, or if it's just sitting there pretty in the driveway. Um, so, like I said, at Butterfly Ridge, we walk a transect. There are certain sections of our trail that we walk uh, at the beginning of every month, and we document every single butterfly that we see. And we've got that data going all the way back to April of 2015. However, you can do something as simple as a garden watch. And that's where you pull the lawn chair out of the garage and set it down next to your garden space. And, and from there, just document who you're seeing, you know, visiting your garden. Uh, needless to say, photography is critical. Uh, not everybody's an expert in butterflies or bees or whatever. So you want to get pictures so that you can have others help you identify what you've seen. It makes it a whole lot easier to keep track of who is visiting the garden. And let's click the right buttons. There we go. So this is some of our data from Butterfly Ridge. And my question to you is, well, is, is our... Are, are our gardens working? Is our engine running? And hopefully you can see from this graph that the answer is yes. At Butterfly Ridge, we've nearly quintupled our butterfly population. And it's strictly just because of, of plant selection and, and how we're managing the habitat. Some keys to having a successful pollinator space. Number one, take what nature gives you. Um, for example, at Butterfly Ridge, we already have a little bit of a wetland on our site. So what we've done is instead of trying to drain the wetland and turn it into a pine forest instead, we've just keep the wetland and we just add additional plants that prefer to have their feet wet. Um, you know, we're not trying to convert deciduous hardwood forest to pine forest, okay? Once again, we just are taking what nature has already given us and trying to enhance that. It's a good idea to understand who already lives there. So for example, at Butterfly Ridge, we actually started that transect data before we did any habitat work at all so that we had that baseline data so we understood who was already there. Um, the second item, plant selection, and I'll have a couple more slides about this here coming up pretty soon. Plant selection is critical. I mean, that, that's the important thing. Now, I'll be honest, at Butterfly Ridge, we are big time native plant nerds, okay? Um, and we utilize those native plants to serve as caterpillar host plants for butterflies and moths, as nectar plants, nesting materials for our native solitary bees, um, we're trying to use native plants to keep everybody happy, so to speak. Um, once again, as we already shared to a degree, using data to help um, drive what we're doing. Um, and keep in mind, these keys that I'm giving you, yeah, Butterfly Ridge is a 21 acre space. I don't know how many of you have 21 acres, but keep in mind, these keys can work anywhere from an apartment balcony size space to literally square miles. It's all the same keys. It's all the same important parts. Now, that comment about using data to make corrections. What you're looking at right now is the very first habitat project that we worked on at Butterfly Ridge. This is one of our many clearings that we have in our deciduous hardwood forest. And that little butterfly that's down there in the bottom right corner, that is a Carolina satyr. Once upon a time, when we first developed this clearing, we were managing it a certain way. And then probably three years ago, I started looking at our data and found that our satyr population in that clearing was tanking, okay? They were diving hard. And so what we did, the fact that our satyrs were struggling, kind of forced our hand, we need to manage this space in a different way because the way we were managing it, 
we were allowing new trees to move into the space, we were controlling how big they would get, not realizing that those new little trees were forcing out the grasses that that little Carolina Seder was relying upon. So now we match the space a little bit differently, trying to give those grasses a little bit more of a heads, a, a leg up, so to speak, to try to benefit um, those satyrs. Now, as I mentioned before, it's all about plant selection, plant selection, plant selection. And as I tell people, and I apologize if I'm going to step on a toe, but I'll do it anyway. Um, you can have the biggest, bestest rose garden in the county, and I can pretty much guarantee you won't have butterfly one. Just because roses aren't built to, to benefit butterflies. Um, and of course, I, mean, I think about life from a butterfly perspective, as my hat indicates. I realize there's other pollinators out there too, although of course, none of them are as important as butterflies. <laughs> but um, the thing is, is actually, if you manage a space for butterflies, everybody else will come as well. The bees will come, the hummingbirds will come, et cetera. So once again, it's all about plant selection. So to give you some ideas and keep in mind, I'm going to be rushing through this. All my cohorts here are giving me looks like, Chris, you need to hurry up. <laughs> I've done I, I've done plant selection talks that went for an hour or two. So, so I, yes, it will feel like I'm rushing. Um, there are certain plant families that are, are ideal selections as far as attracting pollinators. So for example, the milkweed family. You've got purple milkweed there on the left, which is one of my favorites. And actually that's one of my favorite pictures because if you squint real hard to look at it, we actually have four different pollinator groups all on that same flower head. So you've got, you got your butterflies here, of course. We got a bumblebee there. We've got a beetle there and we got a theris moth there. So as you can see, milkweeds, you, you can't go wrong. In the middle, that's butterfly weed, which is technically is also milkweed. If any of you are in the Western part of the US, there on the far right, that is world milkweed, Asclepius subverticillata, which is an excellent pollinator choice as well. Another solid family, to incorporate into your space is the mint family. And the neat thing about the mints is for those of you who are really into herb gardening, you probably already have several mints already in the garden. So for example, rosemary there on the far left, uh, wild bergamot in the middle, and then uh, mountain mint on the far right. Mints are a tremendous choice as far as quality nectar plants for all kinds of uh, pollinators. Finally, the sunflower family. Uh, on the left, we've got purple coneflower being visited by a monarch. In the middle, especially if you're more of in, in, the, in the plains in the western part of the country, Mexican hat is a wonderful choice for some of the smaller butterflies. There on the right, the Joe Pye weed. I did not position those butterflies there. I just came around the corner on the trail and that's what I saw and took a picture of it. So, so yeah, all those tiger swallowtails were in fact hanging out all over that Joe pie. So once again, their plant selection is critical and there are certain groups of plants that tend to work better than others. Now I realize for some folks, the garden is not done until you put the exotic annuals in there. Uh, I am not one of those people, but I realize there's probably several of you who are watching right now. So for you folks, um, here are some uh, suggested annuals that, that are better choices than others. So for example, some really good choices uh, include lantana, French marigolds, those are the little tiny marigolds, uh, zinnia and cosmos, those are all solid butterfly plants, good pollinator plants in general. Um, some of the more common choices for annuals that are not as good of choices for pollinators include petunias, pansies, begonias, sun patients, um, the great big huge giant marigolds with like the big softball heads on the end of them. Um, the flowers are just too big. It's hard for the pollinators to really take advantage of those. And with that, 
Yes, with that, I am going to uh, pass the computer over to Jenna here, and she will talk to you a little bit about a land lab project that she was involved with. Thanks, Chris. Hi, I'm Jenna with the Hawking Soil and Water Conservation District. I am the Watershed Education and Outreach Coordinator here. So this is a project we partnered with Pheasants and Quill Forever, um, the National Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, and with a few employees from the school district. So this project, one of the big things that kind of got it going was after COVID happened, the need and want for an outdoor classroom um, was pretty strong. So we worked on creating this land lab. So the area that um, I'm gonna be talking about is the pollinator area and it's right here labeled as field number three. And the rest of this map is the rest of the land lab. So you can see there's route 33 and that blue line there is the Hawking River. So our first project was with a homeschool group from here in Hawking County. We planted the field three different ways. We did broadcasting. So we had wildflower seeds mixed with rice hulls and the kids just got to, and adults, we did it too. It was a lot of fun. You just throw it out um, wherever in the field. We planted with our plot master cedar. This is our um, technician here on the tractor. She's pulling the plot master cedar. It's planting the um, pollinator seeds. So this is something we will actually rent out to landowners that want to um, put in pollinator plots on their land. And then we also planted some plugs and plant starts. So this is May here. And then here's some progress of the area. So in July, not a lot, but then um, just a few months later in September, you can see there's a lot of pretty color in the area. And in May, so about a year later, May, 2022, we had another workshop. This workshop was mostly focused on landowners that wanted to put in a pollinator plot on their land. So this was um, Pheasants Forever, Pheasants and Quill Forever, and um, Soil and Water, and then NRCS. So they had this project, and um, people got to learn about how to put this into their, like how to have a pollinator area in their land. And then they learned about a few funding opportunities through Farm Bill for landowners that want to put in um, pollinator plots. And here's a little more progress of the area a few months later in August of 2022. And here at Soil and Water, we have a kid's garden. Um, it's sort of a kid's garden backyard demo area so people can learn ways they can put in some vegetables or pollinators in a small area. So our focus is vegetables, but also pollinators. So we have, um, different native pollinators and some of the projects we'll do with our kids garden is look for monarch eggs look for caterpillars and um that's a lot of fun so i'm going to turn it over to andy to talk about the talking hills butterfly trail thank you jenna let me get situated here um May I have the clicker? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the Hocking Hills Butterfly Trail is a project of, of Logan and Bloom, um, and it's funded by the Hocking Hills Tourism Association. It was funded in 2022. And although the, the self-guided trail was developed in 2022 with all phases in place by early 2023, each of those um, 14 locations have provided some type of pollinator habitat or another for quite a while. Each location uh, meets the needs of all four life stages of the featured butterfly, um, egg, caterpillar, pupa, and adult butterfly. And each location has host plants for the caterpillar stage as well as nectar sources for the adult butterfly 
And it also, uh, each, each location provides for how the butterflies overwinter. Some will overwinter as caterpillars, some as uh, chrysalids or pupa, and some even overwinter as butterflies. As you can see in these uh, photographs, each stop has a unique set of wings. They're made of highway sign grade metal. <clears throat> they, they are actual uh, photographs of actual butterflies. They are not an artistic rendition. Um, and those wings have an anti-graffiti coating. And they were produced here locally um, by a company uh, that makes highway signs. We worked with them and they just did a fantastic job. Each uh, set of wings also has a corresponding interpretive signage that explains the habitat needs of that particular butterfly, the host plants, the nectar sources, and the shelter needs of that, those butterflies. Uh, we came up with a trail guide um, that is available both printed and online. And what I really encourage you to do is make note of the website at the bottom uh, so that you, you can certainly download and print off the trail map um, that this side of the, the trail map brochure has the map and all the directions. The flip side of it has information about the unique features of each location and its butterfly. Each of the stops is maintained by a community partner, um, including schools, a land trust, uh, our local hospital, a city park, a community garden, and others. And they cover a wide variety of habitats, both small city lots, as well as expansive meadows and forest clearings, as Chris described with uh, Butterfly Ridge. Uh, the passport and the coloring book Again, available online, you can download those. Um, they serve as interactive souvenirs for the trail. These items, um, the passport can be stamped at any location where there is one of these little flowers that says that it, um, there are uh, staff or volunteers present, present at um, certain times. The first stop is the Hawking Hills Welcome Center Monarch Way Station. And I'd like to kind of build on what Chris said about uh, taking what nature gives us. This is a 330 long foot uh, chain link fence that separates the Welcome Center from the Ohio Department of Transportation facility. And the reason it is opened up here is that the emerald ash borer managed to nail the trees on the other side of the fence. And so this location became really sunny. It's been a certified Monarch Way Station since 2017. It's approximately 1500 square feet because that's the length of this fence is 330 feet. And it's an average of about uh, three to five feet wide at different stages. So there's our before and after pictures. After the garden was in place for several years, Logan and Bloom volunteer and retired art teacher, Sue Karshner came up with the idea of having a set of butterfly wings as a photo op for children. And it became an overnight sensation. The wood and vinyl prototype uh, that Sue built uh, was replaced this past winter with the new metal wings. And although monarchs are great, um, the Hocking Hills Butterfly Trail is more than just monarchs. We have the Great Spangled Fritillary at Capital University's Outdoor Learning Center. This is actually a 76 acre um, area that the Primer family donated to the university. And it includes the pollinator habitat uh, preservation and restoration that began in 2008. And that is the great spangled fritillary, uses violets as a host plant. And behind this, uh, these butterf this butterfly here is a very large pine trail that meanders through the hillside meadow. We have a hospital that is, uh, provides a habitat for an orange sulfur. And 
the hospital, the Hocking Valley Community Hospital actually established this uh, with the assistance of Chris Klein at Butterfly Ridge back in 2017. And it features a mile long fitness and walking trail. City of Logan's Worthington Park was designated as a farmer's market area by Ohio's governor, Thomas Worthington, when he platted out Logan in 1816. So this has been a green space for a long, long time. And downtown tree plantings by the City of Logan Tree Commissioner, uh, Tree Commission, uh, provide the host plants for the silver spotted skipper, and that would be the thornless heli locust. The Bowen House is a historic community center for the arts and education in Logan. The Bowen House itself was built in 1831, and a, uh, one of the residents wrote in her memoirs that in the spring, the lawn was full of spring beauties and Virginia bluebells. So that has been a wonderful pollinator habitat for close to 200 years. The Hocking County Historical and Genealogical Society is a complex of six buildings and garden. Uh, the Red Admiral butterfly wings are placed in front of the Shemp House, which was built in 1881. And these gardens are curated by our Hocking Hills master gardeners. And here, where we're actually broadcasting from right now, is the Hocking Soil and Water Conservation District. And as Jenna explained, um, <clears throat> this is uh, the children's garden. This is a corner of the children's garden. It was certified as a Monarch Way Station since 2017. And <clears throat> the children's garden has actually been active for at least 10 years. The City of Logan Community Garden is uh, actually has an interesting history. It's been ex in existence since 2005, and it is the result of American Bloom advisor recommendations. So thank you, American Bloom. It's because of you that we even have a community garden. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because uh, Kelly is gonna cover the community gardens. It is adjacent to Logan's historic Aqueduct Park, which provides uh, a lot of the, the host plants for the Viceroy. And I'm gonna, <laughs> well, Logan High School is home of the red spotted purple. And that uh, Jenna covered that at the pollinator habitat. You see all the trees in the background that um, all those trees are providing uh, food sources for the red spotted purple caterpillar. Uh, I'm getting backward here. The Pearl Crescent. This is, um, this is at our Chieftain Elementary School. Um, you see in the upper corner right here, this is a Google view of the nature path at Chieftain Elementary. Um, it was designed and created by a PTO parent in 2016. And the gravel path around the nature area is in the shape of none other than Ohio. And we are right here. Uh, so they were extremely ecstatic to be hosting the Pearl Crescent because the Pearl Crescent host plant is asters, and they certainly have a lot of asters. And this yellow circle here uh, points out where the wings are. At Rockbridge State Nature Preserve is the Hackberry Emperor. Um, and I don't know when Rockbridge State Nature Preserve came into existence, but I do know that the Ohio State Nature Preserve system started in 1975, and this is one of the first preserves to be dedicated. So it's been around for quite a while. And uh, the gentleman here posing with the, the wings is uh, um, works for the State Nature Preserve system, and this is the day that he actually installed them. So he's got all of his equipment there. The Appalachia Ohio Alliance Conservation Demonstration Site is a 35 acre site 
Um, Appalachia Ohio Alliance is a land trust organization that has quite a few preserved areas in the region. This is a 42, it's a total of 42 acres, but 35 acres of it is in uh, Prairie. And there's a three quarter mile nature trail that is just loaded with the host trees for caterpillars and nectar sources for the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And Bishop Educational Gardens is um, home to spicebush swallowtails because it has a lot of spicebush and a lot of sassafras trees. So although um, the bishop the bishops donated this 33 acre property to Hawking Soil and Water Conservation District in 2008. It's been maintained as a natural area and a, a garden since the 1970s. Um, and it was, it's been a certified Monarch Way station since 2017. And last but not least, we have Midnight the Cat, who is posing with his mama in front of the Eastern Comma butterfly wings at Butterfly Ridge. Um, this is the home of the Butterfly Ridge and the Polygonia Foundation. And they chose the Eastern Comma because they overwinter as butterflies, hiding in the bark of, of trees and brush piles. And so they see these things flying as early as, as mid-February at Butterfly Ridge. So, and down here in the corner, you can see the interpretive signs that go along. Um, the next up, thank you very much. We'll go back to the Logan Community Garden with none other than Kelly Capuzzi. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Capuzzi, and I am the coordinator for the Logan Community Garden. Um, the Logan Community Garden is about an acre in size. It's fairly large. Um, and we, as Andy said, just became um, the uh, recipient of the Viceroy Caterpillar Wings. So um, we're very excited to share some information with you today about uh, the, pro the uh, projects that we have going on at the Community Garden uh, to encourage pollinators to come to our garden, which is going to increase our food production there. Um, and a lot of the things that we're going to be doing this year in the community garden um, to promote pollinators is also something that you can do uh, to bring pollinators into your own um, landscaping. Um, so this is a really exciting program that we have going on this year with Ohio State University. It's a partnership with Ohio State. They've developed, um, the, they actually have a bee lab at Ohio State. And the Bee Lab wanted to do something to promote uh, pollinator habitat uh, for um, just regular landscaping uh, for, for homeowners. So they developed a program called Plant by Number. And the Plant by Number uh, landscaping program is basically a design uh, where you have um, six by, it's a six foot by 10 foot a garden, very small, very easy to put into um, a, a, you know, a smaller uh, home landscape. Um, and these gardens are going to be for uh, bumblebees, specialist bees, and butterflies and moths. And they're going to develop more over the years that's going to encourage also um, things like uh, bird, hummingbirds and bats and things like that as well. So um, for this year, uh, Ohio State contacted us at the community garden and asked if we would put in some demo gardens to showcase these three different um, plant by number designs. So uh, they, we are actually gonna be getting um, native plants from Ohio State in May, and we'll be installing these gardens uh, this, this year. And um, another really neat thing that I like about this program is that, um, you know, they're gonna tell people where these garden, these demonstration gardens are. So we're gonna get the public to visit our garden. Um, they're gonna, come in and learn more about the native plants and see if they like the design of it. Um, we're gonna have handouts. So it's gonna be an educational opportunity. We'll have handouts uh, there where they can uh, see what the designs are. And it's going to provide information on local nurseries in the area that are um, growing these specific plants for these pollinators. So it's just gonna be a really uh, great win all around. I love that they've pulled in the nurseries too. We have a lot of great um, native plant nurseries in central Ohio, 
um, really all over Ohio. Um, we've been seeing them pop up all over the state. So hopefully uh, you can find some native nurseries in native plant nurseries in your state as well. Um, so Ohio State has also uh, given out a list of some of the keystone plants that will attract pollinators. Um, this particular picture of asters, um, I actually took this picture, it was not in Ohio, it was in Baltimore, Maryland. I was in downtown Baltimore when I took this picture of these beautiful asters, and it was really amazing because I was completely surrounded by concrete um, everywhere, yet there was this patch of asters and it was loaded with bumblebees. Um, it was just amazing. It was so, so beautiful to see. So it doesn't mean, you know, even if you live in a city, even if you're in the middle of an urban area, um, you can totally plant these plants and it will attract the pollinators like you would not believe. Um, one of the keystone plants that I'm really excited about uh, that we're gonna be putting in at the community garden is pussy willow. So willow uh, plants are the host plant for the viceroy caterpillars. Um, viceroys can only eat things in the willow family. So um, alder, cottonwood, and willow are in the willow family. And um, so we're gonna be putting in some willows. The other great thing about willows, they're just a powerhouse of a um, pollinator plant and uh, a host plant. So they will provide early pollen for a lot of our native bees. Ohio has over four to 500 species of native bees. Um, so a lot of the early bees that come out in the spring um, are looking for nectar and pollen and those willows will provide that for them. Um, the other really great thing about willows is they um, are also the host, not only of the viceroy caterpillar, but the host of 320 species of um, moths. So moth caterpillars, uh, there are over 300 species that will use that pussy willow or will anything in that willow family. Um, again, you know, as Chris mentioned, the milkweeds are really important for our um, for the for the monarchs, but they the milkweeds are also providing so much um, pollen and nectar for so many different um, species. So bees really love milkweed as well. Uh, so that's a really great plant. Wild senna, golden Alexander. I love these plants. Um, these are great plants to put in your garden as well. Um, some of those annuals that are great, um, as Chris mentioned, um, we have some native annuals. Partridge pea is really wonderful. And that's something that I am looking at putting in at the community garden. Uh, bellflower, American bellflower is another native annual that is a really wonderful plant to put in the garden as well. Um, so I love these uh, anti-lawn memes. I really relate to the I fought the lawn and the lawn one <laughs> because I just hate, I hate mowing grass. And every year um, as I'm mowing my grass, I'm thinking, oh, I gotta, I gotta just shrink my lawn. I, I need to get rid of this grass. Um, and, you know, I, I do it because maybe more because I'm lazy, but maybe because I love, you know, I love uh, plants. Uh, but honestly, there is a lot of reasons to think about shrinking your lawn. Um, there are a lot of environmental and human health reasons that lawns, um, you know, are really not good for the environment. Um, lawns are one of the most irrigated, the largest irrigated crops in the United States. And I say crops, I, I mean, it's not really a crop, but we, we irrigate lawns more than we do our food crops. So that's just seems crazy to me. Um, it's, and you know, and this is something that's not really providing any food really for, um, wildlife and pollinators. It's pretty much an ecological dead zone, honestly. Um, we also use over a hundred million pounds of herbicides and pesticides annually to um, treat the lawns and maintain them, to make them look lush and beautiful. But, you know, because we're putting on so much herbicides and pesticides, we're actually having a big impact on our pollinators um, and other wildlife as well. We also use a lot of gasoline, 800 million gallons of gasoline is used uh, for lawn maintenance. And, Another sad statistic is about 17 million gallons of gasoline is actually spilled while we're trying to maintain our lawns. And all of those things end up in our waterways. So one of, one of the things that we're experiencing in Ohio, um, we have a lot of um, chemicals that get into the waterways, especially um, uh, phosphorus. Uh, so all those nutrients that are running into um, our waterways are actually making their way into our lakes. Um, Lake Erie 
every year experiences um, harmful algal blooms. So we get a large um, area of the lake that um, just becomes coated in this thing that looks like spilled green paint. And this actually has a big impact on um, all of our drinking water um, sources. When they get, if they get levels of something called microcystin, which is part of the harmful algal blooms, when that gets up to a certain level, it's actually dangerous and harmful for people to consume the water. And sometimes they, the water treatment plants actually have to shut down. And that happened in the city of Toledo a few years ago when we had a very bad harmful algal bloom outbreak. Um, another area of the country that's experiencing um, issues is the Gulf of Mexico. So any of the states that drain into the Mississippi River Basin, um, a lot of these toxic chemicals and pollutants, they're, they're just making this toxic stew of material that makes its way to the Gulf of Mexico, and it creates a dead zone called Gulf hypoxia. Uh, so this is a, a big environmental issue that we really need to deal with. Um, and I love this, you know, I love this idea of us being the change. I mean, I want to be the person in our community that that helps to change people's um, ideas about um, what beautiful looks like. Just as Chris talked about, you know, um, I, I'd like to convince people that we really should think about rejecting this traditional lawn and maybe embracing biodiversity and and you know, maybe reaching out to our neighbors and our families and friends and just say, you know, this is why I am doing this. This is why I want to um, you know, bring more uh, native plants into my own yard and um, you know, really help out our pollinators and, and stop with this you know, crazy uh, treadmill of using all these herbicides and pesticides. Uh, and speaking of herbicides and pesticides, this is one thing that I'm trying to do at the community garden. I'm really trying to, convince our gardeners to stop using so much um, pesticides. A lot of our gardeners really rely heavily on things like seven dust and things like that, um, which are a systemic insecticide that's going to not only kill the pests, but it's going to also kill the pollinators. So um, I'm trying to you know, really work with our gardeners and hopefully this year we can really start reducing the amount of pesticides that we're using. One of the things that I've noticed in our garden is that there are a lot of pests and I understand why people want to use pesticides there because you know, they do get a lot of pests there. But I think it's because for so many years uh, they have been using these pesticides and it's actually causing, uh, they don't have any beneficial insects anymore that are keeping things in check. So I want to turn that around and really try to get our beneficial insects back and start getting on a better um, pathway. Um, another thing that uh, you have to be conscious of when you're buying plants is um, some of our, uh, some of the nurseries will be using systemic insecticides as well. They'll actually inject trees and plants with um, insecticides because, you know, in the old, like the old school way of thinking is we don't want anything eating our leaves. Um, so that's why the nurseries, you know, uses insecticides because they don't want the leaves to be eaten. But when you have a native plant garden, the way you can tell if it's working and if it's successful is that the leaves are getting eaten. So you want the leaves to be eaten. Uh, it's a totally different mindset that you have to think about. And um, I, what I, I, I really love the Xerxes Society. Uh, they uh, have really great information on their website. They have a lot of great books as well, but they have a whole thing about buying bee safe plants. So I highly recommend uh, you looking at that um, if you want to learn more information about um, what could possibly be in plants if you buy them from uh, uh, some of the nurseries. Um, this is another thing that a lot of people do um, that I see all the time is that we get rid of our leaves in our yard. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of our pollinators are living. Um, we have a lot of butterflies and moths that overwinter in the leaf litter. Um, our fireflies are also in the leaf litter. Um, you know, so when you bag up your, your leaves, you're, you might be getting rid of the pollinators that you're attracting to your yard. So um, one of the things that I'm gonna be doing at the community garden this year is I'm gonna be creating um, areas where we can put leaf litter. I'm gonna be making uh, little like low fenced areas around our trees. 
And um, we'll be creating little soft landings underneath the trees where we'll keep the leaves. And that'll be a great place for our pollinators. So we, you know, we need to think about um, providing habitat for the whole entire life cycle of our pollinators from egg uh, to caterpillar to chrysalis to adult. So, um, and this is the same with our bees. Our, our bees also go through complete metamorphosis just like butterflies do. Um, and some of our bee species, our, our solitary bee species are living in the ground uh, for a whole entire year. So um, anything you put on the, on the grass, if you put pesticides or herbicides on the grass, you could be impacting those bee species. Uh, so providing that habitat in your yard is really a great thing for um, the whole entire life stage of our pollinators. Um, you know, leaving brush piles and logs, that's also great for salamanders. I have some, um, some logs that I put in my yard and under every single log last year, I found a redback salamander. So um, it provides lots of habitat, not only for pollinators, for, but for all kinds of species um, that live around your yard. Um, clumping grass is wonderful too for um, our bumblebees. They love uh, putting it, they'll put a, a, their underground nests right underneath those clumping grass areas. If you can have an area where you can put a, uh, have a dead standing tree, that's also a great place for those carpenter bees. Uh, so they're, they're not coming to your house and drilling into the wood. Um, they'll go to that standing uh, dead tree and, and uh, we'll drill in that instead. Uh, that bare sandy soil is also great for our solitary bees. Again, we have over 400 species of, of bees in Ohio that are native to Ohio, and many of them are um, ground nesters and solitary. Um, and another really cute thing you can do, um, I would totally recommend looking this up, but there's all kinds of web or um, YouTube videos on creating a water bee source. So like you can actually make a bird bath but put rocks in it and like maybe some moving water and bees will come to it. I've done that and like, we'll get honeybees and bumblebees. It's really cute to see. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna mention is uh, turning off your lights. That's another thing you can do easily as a homeowner. Um, it'll save you money. Um, I do this at my own house. I actually had a big giant floodlight that um, was on all the time and I asked the electric company to turn it off and they did. So I do not have the, that floodlight there anymore. Um, I've put in all I've put all of my um, lights on timers or I have motion sensors. Um, so you know you can really save a lot of money and this is really going to benefit all of your uh, pollinators that are sensitive to light. Um, so things like moths, you would not believe how many moths come to your garden at night. It's pretty amazing. Um, there's over probably a few thousand species of moths in Ohio and many of them are pollinating our gardens in the in the dark. We don't even see that they're doing it, but they're out there, they're, they're working hard. And when you have light, um, it really is disruptive. It's very disruptive too for fireflies as well. Um, and one other thing that I'm really great, grateful to see is in Ohio, um, many of our larger cities are um, doing something called lights out. So um, they are turning the lights out in the downtown areas so that the nocturnal animals that are migrating through, such as our warblers, migratory um, uh, warblers from the south, um, as they're migrating through, they have they work with Audubon Society. They turn those lights out, and that avoids um, the birds from hitting the buildings downtown and dying. So a lot of birds will strike buildings as they're migrating through, and it, it'll kill a lot of birds. Um, and so finally, the last thing is to advocate for dark skies because we all I know we all love to see the stars. So I just really want to thank you guys so much for letting us talk to you about our favorite subject. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to leave up our um, contact information. This is for Chris Klein at Butterfly, uh, Butterfly Ridge. And um, we also had some other websites that we thought you might be interested in as well. And uh, we'll leave this up while we take questions. So thank you guys very much. Wonderful job, Logan and Bloom. Great job. We have a lot of questions, so I am going to ask Logan and Bloom to be uh, brief in your responses, if possible, okay? We're just going to go ahead and dig right in. And Chris, this first one is for you. Early in your uh, presentation, you had the graph. The question is, why the big dip in 2020? 
Okay, the big dip in 2020 was because of weather that we had in April and May. We had a lot of cold and a lot of rain. And unfortunately, what that did was that knocked our butterfly population down actually to the point where the butterfly population did not actually rebound that year until close to August. So it, it was very much a weather driven thing. Thank you. Next question. Uh, people love the wings. Can you purchase them? Uh, Andy's sliding over and we'll let Andy tackle that one. Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the company that we purchased the wings from is called Osborne Associates um, here in Logan, Ohio. They, they are on the web with their telephone number. You can contact them. Um, they obviously have experience with making butterfly wings out of highway grade metal. Uh, all we really needed to do was provide them with the um, high resolution photographs. Uh, so uh, all of the wings are actually Hocking County, um, Logan, Ohio butterflies um, that they were able to um, adhere however they work their magic. So I would suggest uh, looking them up on the uh, on the the internet. I don't have their contact information right here, but they do have a a web preference uh, web presence. Great, thank you. Uh, do any of the stops, and I'm going. I'm not sure what this means. Do any of the stops use fire as maintenance? And do you have any data on whether the pollinators increase as a result? That's a really good question. Of course, the. Um, the locations that are within the city limits do not use fire. Um, that, that poses a little bit of an issue with our fire marshal. Um, for the, the locations outside um, of the city limits, I'm trying to run through my brain. Most of them are so close to the city that they, they work with the city of Logan fire department and they don't do that either. Um, I, think, I think the AOA site does. Yes, the, the Appalachia Ohio Alliance site does use that, um, does use fire. And on their website, they do have uh, some photographs and information about that. I, I know that uh, the AOA uh, staff and volunteers are registered for this presentation. So um, I the only thing that I would do is recommend that you go to their their website for the contact information. We don't have their website listed here. Hopefully right, so that answered your question about on, fire. Let's keep on moving, Andy. There was a quick question. Could you please spell Osborne, the sign fabricator? O-S-B-O-R-N-E. Jenna's looking it up right now. All right, we'll come back if there's a change to that. We have a couple questions on plant selection. I don't know where these people live, so do the best you can with what you know. Um, the first question is, what is a pollinator flower that likes shade and is deer resistant? Oh boy, that, that's a rough combination right there. Um, I see a butterfly ridge, uh, see. There is, there is actually, believe it or not, a species of milkweed that we have here in the east that prefers shade. Uh, it's called poke milkweed, Asclepius exaltata. And the, the bees especially really enjoy the poke milkweed as far as nectar sources go. Uh, cardinal flower, that can tolerate um, a fair amount of shade. Uh, and of course, butterflies and, and hummingbirds uh, are really good at going for that. Uh, spice bush, uh, as far as like host plants go, spice bush, I mean, that's where you typically find it is in the shade. Another good one as far as caterpillar host plants are the violets. Uh, you want them kind of planted at the edge of woods or near a large tree, but the violets are also really shade tolerant. Uh, okay, and I've got a, a correction on the Osborne Associates. That's O S B U R N Associates Incorporated. Great. Another plant selection are the uh, are other cone flowers. Excuse me. Are there other cone flowers besides purple cone flower that are beneficial for attracting pollinators? 
Yes, I would say most of the cone flowers uh, would be good choices. However, I am going to throw a little bit of a caveat in here in that, I mean, if you go to your local garden center, you're going to find, for example, purple cone flower as our example, you're going to find a half a dozen different kinds of purple cone flower because they have been bred to have different color petals you know, ray flowers. They've been bred to have double sets of ray flowers. They've been bred to have um, the disc flowers in a great big long cone type thing. Realize, unfortunately, frequently when, um, when we tinker with plants to get those specialized characteristics, there's something that gets tinkered out, and that is nectar production. And so I strongly advise when you go to your garden center, try to get a form of cone flower that is as close to the wild form as you can get. If you look at the plant tag and it says purple cone flower, Billy Bob's burgundy bouquet B9937, I would avoid that one. Okay, just go for the one that simply says purple cone flower. Great. Regarding dead standing trees. Is there any information regarding leaving downed trees in place for use by carpenter bees? Um, yes, carpenter bees will use down uh, logs as well. So there's a lot of uh, different bees that are, um, besides carpenter bees, that will use um, uh, logs and dead trees. Um, so not, they're not the only ones, but there are, you know, there are some other nest building uh, bees that will, will go into uh, those areas as well. All right, couple more questions. Uh, does the city of Logan have a policy regarding maximum lawn height? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Andy said yes. <laughs> yes, there's zoning uh, laws in place for that. Yes. Okay. So, um, so I guess maybe people are wondering what you can do if you have a pollinator garden and um, you're worried that your um, your particular area, HOA or whatever, might be um, going to give you a ticket potentially. Um, there are things you can do to make your garden look more intentional. So I highly recommend putting up a sign that says, this is a native plant garden. That right there will tell your neighbors, I am intentionally growing native plants. The other thing you can do, which is, it, it sounds dumb, but it works amazingly, is put a little border around your plants with grass. Um, I don't know why, but when people see a border, so maybe even just like a piece of wood or some stones, um, and then you might have a strip of grass in front of that, it just makes people think, oh, this is intentional. They, me they meant to do this. So um, those are some things you can do to, to make it look intentional. Great answer. Our last question is, a mention was made that there was funding available for local people with land to create pollinator areas. Are people in rural areas notified of this? And where does one get information on this program? Um, I would contact your local soil and water district office um, and your natural resource conservation district. Um, throughout the United States, um, there's fund, there is funding available, and it's through the Farm Bill. Um, there's other organizations as well, as Jenna mentioned, the Pheasants Forever. Um, they have a lot of funding right now. Uh, there's a big push right now to, um, to plant pollinator uh, gardens or po pollinator, like whole pollinator meadows. Um, so they're actually they are there's actually a lot of funding, a lot of match money that's available. So definitely contact um, soil, your your local soil and water office for that information. Thank you so much. All right, we have run out of time. I am going to turn things over to Lisa Collins, who is American Bloom's development manager, for some final comments. But uh, I do want to thank everyone at Logan and Bloom for this incredible uh, webinar. Hi, Lisa. Great to see you today. Hi, thank you. Again, thank you to our presenters, our friends from Logan and to Eason Horticultural Resources who sponsored today's webinar. We invite you to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, where we will post a link to this webinar and others that we offer. If you have a subject you'd like to see us cover, we hope that you will um, email, email us. You can send me a message at lisa at americainbloom.org. 
And while you're thinking about that, learn about how your community can participate at americainbloom.org on the web. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you at the next webinar.